Good morning. Good morning. This past Friday, I turned 51 years old. Hey! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and I spent the day with my son going through um, college orientation. It was a great day. And my poor child, I'm trying to look where he was. He had to tolerate me. I, I cried three times throughout the day. So he was having fun, and then he'd have to pick me up. And he'd go have fun and then pick me up. And because it was just emotional time. It was really a lot of joy. Um, but that time of releasing your children, when that's kind of how I've defined myself my whole life as a mom. But what I have noticed over the last, you know, I don't know, five, ten years, one common theme for every time my birthday kind of rolls around, the theme has been every year it gets better. Every year it just seems like life is better. And so I began to think about why is that the case, and I, I really believe it has a lot to do just with my spiritual journey that, that God is just working on me, and he stirs in me and, and works to help me find the peace that he can supply all of us. And, and just as you get older, you begin to understand, maybe I just need to listen, and, and finally it's just easier to start surrendering and and hearing those words of wisdom and peace that come from God. I think it just becomes easier the older that we get. I'm so thankful um, to this church family. You know, we've been here from my husband and our family, Lindsay and Michael, have been here from the very beginning of the church starting up, and I'm just so thankful for all the mentors in this church. Um, of course, Wade and, and many of you that have really been intentional about helping me to continue to be serious about growing my faith and, and during times that I had difficult questions or difficult issues and just kind of wrestling around with me, um, you've really been such a huge part of my, my faith journey and really my faith journey to Methodism. I feel like that Liberty Crossings has been my pathway to learning about being a Methodist. You know, Lana, and I, I think I'll get this number right, but a couple of years ago she surveyed our church and found that really there are only about 4% of us that um, call ourselves Methodists. You know, we're just, there are a lot of denominations, a lot of different faiths that are represented in this church, and, and like me, I grew up in a different denomination. I grew up Baptist, and it was a great um, foundation for my faith. I grew up with two parents of deep faith. My mom's here today, and so thankful for everything that she did regarding that because she reminded me to pray she reminded me to be you know to study to show up at church to be a part of small groups reminded me that who I hang out, hung out with you know reflected in who I became for sure she kept me on that kind of straight and narrow and just reminded me about my faith but it was interesting being a Baptist I you know most of my small groups and um, devotion times and things were spent with people in lots of different denominations. And growing up Baptist, I was made fun of a lot, and I just didn't really understand this at first, but, you know, they called us teetotalers. And I didn't even know what that word meant for the longest time, but um, several of my friends were reminding me, yeah, if you're Baptist, y'all don't drink, y'all don't dance, you don't do all this fun stuff, y'all just, you know, who wants to be a Baptist? And I remember thinking to myself, gosh, I never thought about that. I don't remember hearing that from the pulpit. I don't remember hearing that in any of my small groups, and I definitely didn't hear that at home. And then one day, my mom bought a piece of furniture, and she was showing some friends. It was a beautiful chest, and, um, but you could open the top, and out would lift a bar. And then you could shut it, and it would go down. So you could keep, you know, keep your drinks and alcohol or whatever in your um, glasses. And she goes, it's told me it was called a Baptist bar. And I said, what is that? And she goes, you know, you can drink, but if somebody that's coming in that's not Baptist, you can shut it real quick, and so people don't know that you drink, and it kind of <laughs> lowers down. But she didn't make that up. It was actually called a Baptist bar. I've never heard of that. So it was hilarious to me. So all of a sudden I realized, well, I guess I don't know the rules of being a Baptist. But... I also was, out at, uh, was at a camp with a friend, um, it was a sports camp, and it was for a couple of weeks, and, and um, one night we were up late and talking, and, um, and she was, got really, really emotional, and she, wasn't, she was from a different denomination, and she just expressed her deep concern that I wasn't going to heaven because I was um, Baptist. And, um, and I remember you know, immediately telling her that if nothing else, that I was raised with a deep assurance of my faith and where that meant that I was going to be for eternity. 
Um, but you could tell she was so distraught because she loved me so much and she just believed that there might be a divide between the way I was raised and what I believed and where she was and what that outcome um, might be. This kind of started my almost rebellion toward denominations. You know, I just didn't understand. It seemed like denominations made things more complicated and um, confusing and at that age I was looking for something just much simpler than that and that's when I kind of turned most of you that know me well enough know that the red words are really important to me when when things get complicated and the world gets difficult and we're fussing about different things within church or within the world or whatever my easiest place to go are the red words they're real straightforward for me now obviously at 51 I understand the importance of the Old Testament and the black words that God speaks to us through all of them but I've just found a real spot there that's helped me in that time of kind of being rebellious about um, uh, different denominations but when I was a junior in high school I remember I was a part of FCA it's Fellowship of Christian Athletes and I was at a meeting and we started reading different verses and and if you have your Bible and you want to turn I'm gonna um, review with you uh, Mark 7 1 through 9 and this was a verse that we read over that night and it kind of played into this whole denomination thing for me again Mark 7 1 through 9 the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with with hands that were unclean that is unwashed the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they they gave their hands a ceremonial washing holding the, to the tradition of the elders when they come from the marketplace they do not eat unless they wash and they observe many other traditions such as washing of the cups and the pitchers and the kettles so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands he replied Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites as it is written these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me they worship me in vain their teachings are but rules taught by men you have to go you have excuse me you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men and he said to them you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions and it made me think about and what we discussed in our group is how easy it is to try to set up in different denominations of whatever we focus on different um, passages but we focus on living out the law of the word and in that sometimes we miss the heart of the of the word and um, and so that's what became very clear to me in reading that and I even of course at whatever age I was 15 years old thought you know I bet Jesus wouldn't like denominations either Jesus and I are on the same side that's what I figured and so from that point forward for years and years when people would ask me so what are you and I would say Christian and they say no I, I know that but what denomination and I would say Christian and it wasn't that I was embarrassed about being Baptist I loved growing up as a Baptist but I just didn't find myself connected to any one denomination I was a Christian and I felt like my denominational connections you know kind of made things more difficult made it harder in some cases to see God and relate to one another so I began to get pretty stubborn about that and it's funny over the years when Scott and I first got married um, we attended and joined a um, uh, Presbyterian church and of course I was prompted to think well gosh I grew up Baptist and didn't know all the rules so I'd like to go find kind of the book of discipline for the Presbyterian church and so I asked the pastor for that and I got kind of a, a book of discipline for them and I actually went back and pulled the one for the Baptist church and then when we joined the Methodist Church I did the same thing and when I say I read the book of discipline for each of those I, you know I'd glance through and whatever but I found great humor in and y'all are welcome to do this if you pull the Baptist and the Presbyterian and the Methodist related to alcohol very very similar wording but very similar and why do you think it's similar it's I mean simply because we know you drink too much you do things that you probably shouldn't and gets us in trouble right so everybody understands that and so when you look at the wording for all three of those denominations they are very very conservative and very similar but there's something about us that likes to celebrate or talk about our differences the things we don't have in common instead of celebrating what we do have in common 
But when I've glanced through all those disciplines, we are very, very similar in our beliefs. And so I found, found that to be funny, but we seem just to like to focus on our differences. Adam Hamilton is a, a pastor of the Church of, uh, I think it's the Church of the Res uh, Resurrection, couldn't get it out, Church of the Resurrection. And it's one of the, if not the largest church, United Methodist Church in the country, it's, um, it's one of the largest. And I was watching a video fairly recently of where he was speaking to some seminary students, and I found, um, I found some of the things that he was saying to, to be interesting. First of all, he said, as Methodists, we pursue via media. And I'd never heard of that. Of course, I didn't grow up Methodist, didn't know what that meant, via media. And he described that to be the middle way. He said, as Methodists, we believe that all sides, almost always, have truth in it. And that the way we're structured is that we are to listen to both sides of, of a situation, an idea, an issue, whatever it might be. And if we would learn from each other's strengths, that we would be a better church, we'd be, be better people. And he began to describe, that's how the government's set up, right? We have several um, sides, and if we would listen to each other's strengths and ideas and learn from that, we would be a better country. Well, he began to describe the definitions that affects us in, in the country from um, conservative and liberal. And he gave the definition of conservative. He opened and, and defined it as um, the dictionary and defined it as conservative, as conserving and preserving. And he said, as the church goes, I mean, these are folks that are working hard to preserve and conserve our, our truths of our faith, our traditions, our, you know, the things that are important to us about our faith. They lead us in, in being responsible in conserving and preserving our assets and our, and our many blessings and ensuring that we're spending them thoughtfully and as God would have us to do. And he looked around and he said, who wouldn't want to be that? And then he gave the definition of liberal. And he said generous, willing to share, responds to new ideas. He said that the, the word comes from a Latin word, a liberal comes from a Latin word, it means freedom. And it focuses on the, the freedom and the, of individual rights of people. And he looked around the room and he said, who wouldn't want to be that? And so he began to describe what happens at his church all the time, that when people are coming to visit him or visit the church, you know, he has like, I don't know, 10, 15,000 people attend each service every week. And when people have come four or five times, they are trying to decide, is this the church for me? And a lot of times they would like to meet with him, and so they come into his office, and they get talking, and they almost without fail say to him, Adam, you know, you confuse us. What are you? And he says, what do you mean? He goes, are you, and they'll say, are you liberal? Or are you conservative? And he goes, well, of course, yes. And they said, no, 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 which one? I mean, they just want him to say which one. And he says, can I not be both? You know, Adam, in that, in that conversation, he says, the Methodist church, we are at our best when we're liberal conservatives or conservative liberals. That's when we're at our best. I mentioned this to Scott. We were talking about different topics that I was going to be sharing in the sermon, and we both said, ah, oh, not a good idea to mention anything political. And I said, well, it's really not political. It's just def defining conservative and liberal, so it's really not political. And we and said, Tracy, just, just don't do this. Just not a good idea. So I appreciate y'all are all still sitting there. But the reason I decided it was okay is because this is a Methodist church. John Wesley is associated with a, um, a phrase that he said a lot. I don't think he coined the phrase, but he said it a lot in, um, in a lot of his sermons and, and speeches and even in some of his um, journals that he wrote. But he said, in the essentials unity, all else liberty, and everything charity. And the first time I heard that quote, I got really interested in Methodism and understanding John Wesley. Because all of a sudden, you know, I had this vision of being a Baptist and, and 
people telling me that Baptists had it all wrong. And I for sure knew Baptists didn't have it all right, but they didn't have everything wrong. Methodists don't have it all right, but they couldn't have everything wrong. And so all of a sudden, I could just relate to this concept of, okay, we're going to believe in essentials, but, but hey, let's talk about these different things. Let's be open and be able to discuss them. Yes, sometimes we're going to wrestle, and yes, sometimes we're going to get really frustrated, and yes, sometimes we're really, really, really going to disagree. But if we listen to both sides, because almost always there's truth on both sides, and if we're willing to listen to one another, and learn from each other's strengths, then we become our best people. We become our best church. And so that really attracted me to the concept of just learning about um, John Wesley. And so I began to really get pretty serious about wanting to learn more about John Wesley. So I'm going to share some things about him and his life. Um, he was born in Epworth, England in 1703 to Samuel and Susanna um, Wesley. And Samuel was a pastor at St. Andrews there in Epworth. But I want to start and tell you a little bit about Susanna, his mother. Her job, of course, was to run the home and to maintain the house and, and to um, educate her children. And she was a highly educated woman, which was very unusual back in the 18th century. And so what was really important to her was that she was a part of the intellectual and the spiritual formation of her children. And she treated her um, female children the same as she did her male children and she was very intentional about their intellectual and about their spiritual growth she expected them to learn their ABC's in one day as soon as they could speak a full sentence she had them memorize the Lord's Prayer but the thing I loved about her most is that she met with each child each week individually and she would ask how well is it with your soul and as I think about that, it's such a personal question. And I think if I walked up to any of you right now after church and said, how well is it with your soul? That would feel just kind of invasive, like, ooh, how do you answer that question? You know, it'd feel uncomfortable. But she raised her children to think about every day and every week how well they were spiritually. And she was a part of that. And I, just, I think that's just an incredible um, parenting thing. Samuel, again, like I said, was a pastor at St. Andrews in Epworth, um, England. And they were city people. They had moved to Epworth, which is on the outskirts of the city. And he, um, so they were perceived as pretty different from the people in, in this particular town because they were from the city. And they supported the king, which wasn't very popular on the outskirts of the city. And so I'm sure Samuel expressed some of his political thoughts in his sermons, and they weren't much appreciated in the area. And so interesting enough, one night, several, a group of people, whomever, got together and literally burned their parsonage down while the family was in the home. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, sometimes I think it's crazy that we write letters to the bishops about all of our pastors all over the country, but burning someone's house down is a little extreme. And literally, they had to rush out of the house, had all the children, and Susanna was counting to make sure they all were there, and everybody got out except for John Wesley. And so she began to pray. They began screaming and wondering where he was. People from the town came in and began to sit on each other's shoulders and build up literally till they got in front of the window where John Wesley was, and they found him, and he jumped out, and he was rescued. Literally, as the house was burning down. After all of this was over and everybody from the town had gone back to their own homes, the Wesleys got together and, of course, prayed and just were so thankful and, um, to God for rescuing all of them. But especially they were thankful that John Wesley had been um, rescued because they really thought that they had lost him. In that moment, as they were praying, um, Susanna said, I have a verse that comes to mind over this, and it was Zechariah, and I'm going to share it with you. Zechariah 3 2 which I have to kind of laugh no matter what's going on with my family nothing in Zechariah just hits my my mind <laughs> but for Susanna a very um, woman of deep faith knew even Zechariah's verses and it was verse Zechariah 3 2 and she said and read this aloud to her family and not only did she read it aloud to her family but she spoke the words into John Wesley 
The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? She told John Wesley from there forward that God had snatched him up from that fire and had rebuked Satan, would not have allowed him to be taken because he had a purpose on this planet. And John Wesley absolutely believed that, and he felt a calling to share the good news with not only non-Christians but nominal Christians. He was really focused on that and felt a calling from early on. But he was very driven by that he had a purpose that God snatched him up out of that fire and saved him and allowed him to live, to live on. He went to college, and as he left for college, like most of us do, he struggled with his faith. He struggled with the concept of wanting so much to have a disciplined Christian life that he had been taught. But then that was wrestling with the concept of having a life that desired the flesh and, and things of the world. And so during his college years, he really, really struggled with his faith. It's just, you know, a fairly typical time that, that kids go out and start spreading their wings. So that was a very normal thing, it seemed to me, for him to go through. But in 1726, he was asked to be a fellow at Oxford University. And so this was almost, my interpretation um, is like a, a preacher, but kind of an assistant. And so he was a fellow there, and one of his tasks was to become a mentor to the young um, college students there. And this was really the beginning of Methodism. Because what he started to do, with his, his youngest brother was there, Charles um, Wesley, and Charles had two friends that he met with on a regular basis, um, weekly, just to talk about how their faith was going and trying to encourage one another to stay within the faith. And John Wesley became their mentor. And as he started to mentor them, hundreds of other people joined this group. And the way John Wesley approached um, this kind of mentoring was like his mother had done for all of the children, which is very methodical, very intentional. They would, um, they committed to to reading all the intellectual books of that time and they would get together read them and talk about it and kind of converse about what they thought they so they wanted to intellectually challenge themselves but also they um, got up two days I mean every morning really early four and five in the morning to pray and to have devotion time they were highly committed to serving they went to the um, to the prisons they served the poor they taught the children of the poor they were highly committed John Wesley was even made fun of by the community because he had really long hair, and at first he couldn't afford to have his hair cut. But eventually he was able to, to have his hair cut, but he decided, gosh, I've gone this long without cutting my hair. Why, sh why should I do that? I should use the money for the poor. But people didn't like that in the church, that he had long hair. But if you see all the pictures or paintings of him, he's got long hair, and it was for, for a good reason, which I love. But this group was a very, very intentional group about their faith. And people began to make fun of them, kind of like, you know, I can relate to, right, as a Baptist, people began making fun of them and saying they were, like, really too religious. And so they called this club the Holy Club, and it was kind of just making fun of them because they were really intentional and, and um, uh, very excited and had a lot of enthusiasm about their faith. And literally a couple years after that, in like 1732, the coined phrase of Methodist, Came because people began to call them Methodists because they had a very intentional method by which they grew their faith. And so John Wesley decided that sounded okay to him. He thought that was good to be methodical about growing your faith. And so that's where um, Methodism and, and Methodists came from. This little holy group was defined by some pretty great characteristics. This is how other people on the outside defined them, that they, they had a union of intellect and heart which I love. You know, it's asking that we don't check our brain at the door, that we bring it in. So it was this union of intellect and heart. It was a passion for Christian living and a passion for social justice in the world that this group had. And they had an emphasis on spiritual disciplines. And most importantly, they had a deep longing for holiness. So that's what they were known for, and some people liked it, some people didn't. But at this time in Wesley's life, he was really struggling and having a crisis of faith. And what he didn't understand was, he, every day he was diligent about 
this kind of methodical approach to his faith, but he still felt very far away from God. And he didn't understand how that could happen. And he was very depressed about it. He didn't want anybody to know. And if you think about this, all our pastors out in the world, we go through this, right? Don't you know they do? And it's very hard to admit it and to tell anyone. But we all go through crises of faith like this. And, and he just really was struggling and felt like he didn't have anyone to share that with. But he still felt a strong calling to share um, the good news. And he felt a calling to go to America, to the colonies. And so he did that, and he, wanted, he really felt a need to, to speak to the Native Americans. So he jumped on a, sail, uh, jumped on a boat and, and was sailing for America. And he realized he was on a boat with lots of other Christians, but they were the Moravian Christians. And what was interesting is multiple times on this trip, they had very bad weather, and John Wesley felt like he was going to, you know, he was going to die. He thought the ship was going to capsize and they were all going to die. And he was scared to death. But he looked over at the Moravian Christians, and they were singing and laughing and enjoying time together, and he realized that they had this sense of peace that he just didn't get. So, of course, that even made him feel worse. He just really was struggling with this faith thing. But he landed in Savannah, Georgia. If you've ever been there, it's the first American Wesleyan church. It's a beautiful church. And he landed there, and one of the first things that happened to him is he met a wonderful woman. And... Um, uh, she stayed by his side. They were very connected. He loved her very much. And they just enjoyed time together. But she was ready to get married. And John Wesley couldn't quite figure out, kind of like Paul, couldn't quite figure out how in the world do you fit marriage and family in and trying to figure out all this other stuff. And so he just wasn't quite ready to do that. And he really felt like he probably was never ready to do that. Well, evidently, she understood that he wasn't going to commit. She still loved being around him, so she showed up, and they spent time together, but she was dating someone else on the side. And guess what? That guy was ready to commit. And so John Wesley heard rumor that she had been married that Saturday before. She didn't break up with him. She didn't mention it to him. Didn't say she'd been dating somebody else. She just shows up married. And of course, it devastates him. And so that Sunday, as always, she shows up with, at church with her parents and with her new husband. And it was time to have communion, and they come down for communion, and he refuses to serve them. And he explains to them, you need to apologize to me. You need to repent. You've mistreated me, and I'm not going to serve you communion until you do so. Well, you can only imagine that didn't quite go over well. And uh, her family was very well known and loved in this community so literally at the end of the church service all the men got together and ran John Wesley out not out of the church not out of the area out of America literally he took what he had in hand and jumped on a ship and sailed back to London so think about it he comes with a crisis of faith he has another crisis of faith on the ship coming over and now he's thrown out of America. He's not having a good time at this point. And one of the quotes that, um, that came out of that that was in his journal says, I went to America to convert others and was never myself converted to God. He's still really struggling. And you think about at this time, he's still having an incredible impact um, in the Methodist movement but he's really struggling with his own faith. But what I love about him most is he never gave up his disciplined approach to his faith. He still did all of those things that grew his faith and just assumed God was going to figure this out for him. And he attended a small group one night on Aldersgate Street. It was a meeting that he wasn't lead, leading. He was just attending to learn. And, and he got there, and he claims that that was his very first true experience of the full acceptance of God's love and grace and mercy. It was like he had this light bulb moment that he had things backwards. That he had this methodical checklist of how to live a holy life. And he was really, he didn't even, I don't think he was even aware, but that he was earning, trying to earn God's love and acceptance. And in that night, somehow he got this light bulb moment of that's not how it works that we just have to accept God in our lives and he accepts us and loves us and it's through a grateful heart that then we turn and serve him because of his acceptance and love for us 
In his journal, he describes that moment this way, that his heart was strangely warmed. He was so excited about this conversion in his life. You think about it, he went through this long time of really struggling with his faith. And he had this moment of conversion. He was so excited, he wanted to tell everybody. And so he went back to Oxford, and he still was a fellow there, and they rotated who would, who would um, lead the sermons each week, and it was his time. And so he went in. Now remember, this isn't a normal congregation. This is a, um, a group of, of ministers and teachers and, and all these people of great faith and great leadership. And um, I'm going to share just a little bit, um, read real quickly a couple of things from his sermon. He was so excited, and he wanted everybody to feel the challenge that he felt from his conversion. You vulnerable men who are more especially called to form the tender minds of youth, to dispel the shades of ignorance and error from them and train them up to be wise to salvation. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you see the wisdom to salvation? Are the fruit of the Spirit which are important in your office so indispensable in your office? Are they manifested in your lives? Is your heart whole with God, full of love and zeal to set up his kingdom on earth? Do you continually remind those under your care that one rational end, that the one rational end of all, all of our studies is to know, love, and serve the only true God and Jesus Christ by whom he hath sent? Do you, I've never used this word before, but inculcate upon them day by day that love that alone never fails? He was just excited. He wanted to know, do y'all all feel like I feel? There's just this great, amazing thing that I'm experiencing. They didn't appreciate that. Because it felt like to them, they were, he was kind of questioning where they were in their faith. And so they invited him never to preach again inside a church. Ever again. This man has been thrown out of America, and now he has been thrown out of every church. He can attend, he just cannot preach. Now, I don't know about y'all, but this is the point where I typically say to myself, well, that's God's sign. I'm not supposed to be in the ministry. Preaching is not for me. I'm supposed to do something differently. But it never, it doesn't appear that it ever entered his mind. He was so passionate. He knew he had a purpose about sharing God's love to the world. And what he found was he realized he didn't have to be inside a church. He could stand outside. And guess what? He reached the unchurched, as we call them, right? The nominal Christians, the non-Christians, easier outside the church than inside the church and he would start preaching and he'd have thousands and thousands of people show up so it ended up being a great thing and how god works it's just amazing something bad and he makes something good out of it so anyway but if you read some of his journals which i hope you will because some of them are just hilarious his the, what he writes in them but one thing that i remember reading and thinking i didn't quite understand it but he said today was a great day i didn't get hit by a vegetable what does that mean? And so I began to look into it. Well, all of these thousands of people would show up, and there were lots of people that didn't agree with what he said. And so they'd rear back with a tomato or a potato or whatever and throw it at him. And he considered it a great day when he wasn't hit by a vegetable. It wasn't long after that that his father passed away, and he returned to Epworth, England, and still he was not allowed to preach at his father's funeral. But after the funeral, he went outside and stood on the top of his father's grave and preached, and hundreds of people began to come. Not the people that were in the church. There were only a few there. But hundreds of people showed up and listened to him because he was just simply gifted. And he had something to share, and it was his purpose in life. Much later on, he built the headquarters of Methodists, and they were doing great things. Literally, they even created a bank for the poor, which is like micro-lending today. It was just amazing how far, you know, just ahead thinking he was. He was just, you know, led the church in some great, doing some great things. And as all this was happening in Europe, in America, the Methodist movement was just moving just amazingly fast. Great things were happening. And in 1778, they built a church around that headquarters, which I think had been a very long time since he'd been in a church, and he, he built the church, and they built him a, uh, a home. But by this time, he was highly respected in America and in Europe. And on his deathbed, one of the last things that he wrote was this, Best of all, God is with us. 
which I love because I think that was where his crisis of faith was. He never felt God, and then he went through that conversion and felt God in his life. And so the best thing that ever happened to him was that he felt that God was with us, and he wanted to make sure that we all knew that and that we all experienced that because for me, I know I go through times where I don't feel like God is with me. But he is an incredible inspiration to me, John Wesley, in his faith because when he didn't feel close to God, he kept plugging away, whereas sometimes when I don't feel close to God, I kind of give up on it and kind of go off and do my own thing. But he kept plugging away. His discipline, his dedication to his faith, his faults and his failures feel so similar to some of the things that I've messed up on, so I, I can so relate to him. But instead of giving up, literally, he stirred up a revival of faith all over America and Europe. A Methodist faith that captures a reasonable enthusiasm, one that asks us to bring our intellect into the door, not to check our brain out, one that has experiences of a warm heart as he experienced at Aldersgate meeting. A faith that lives out an evangelical gospel, one where we are so excited about where we are in our faith that we want to share it with others and have them transform so that they can share it with others and transform others. A faith that embraces a social gospel that stands up for social justice in this world. He started a movement around that and to have a liberal and conserving spirit, one of open hearts and minds and doors of generous spirit while conser conserving the great truths of our faith. I'm really inspired, like I said, by John Wesley, his dedication to purpose, his discipline during his crisis of faith was just so impressive to me. And here I am at 51, really desiring the same thing I desired when I was 15, looking for a simple way to continue to know God more, to love God more, and to serve God more. And as I look at it, the characteristics of that holy group really, really attract me. They seem simple to me. The union of in intellectual and heart, the passion for a Christian for Christian living, passion for social justice in this world, an emphasis on those simple spiritual disciplines, but mostly a deep desire for holiness. That just seems like a real simple approach. You know, I still don't feel like, I mean, I still feel like denominations can get in our way and prevent us from learning from one another. But today I stand in front of you and say that I'm a Christian and I am a proud Methodist because I believe that this approach that John Wesley has shown us and that lives within us to listen to all sides and understand that all sides most of the time have truth in them that if we just listen to one another that we grow and become our best selves the world needs that we have something unique as Methodist people. And whether you call yourself Methodist, you know, like me, whether you don't want to be a denomination or you're some other denomination or some other faith, Methodist has something amazing to share with the world. Amen. What I'd like you to do, I placed in your um, seat, it's called John Wesley's Covenant Prayer. He did not write this but it was one of the prayers that he prayed consistently at four or five in the morning. I'd like to pray this together, and, and it, this might be something you want to keep and, and make it a part of your prayer life. Let's read it together. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt, rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty, let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, I am thine, so be it. 
and the covenant for which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.